Well, Dan, that, that's a very interesting. You know, it, it certainly lends itself to uh, longevity, at least in my opinion, when something's able to be absorbed, if you will, into existing infrastructure, into a, a, a legacy of doing that kind of work. And you can certainly bolster a business with that. So that's, that's good background to know and understand. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Cashing Out, brought to you each week by Hoban Law. I'm Dan Humiston, and I'm going to be here by myself today. I spoke to Dina earlier, and she's not going to be able to join us on today's call, unfortunately, but she'll be back next week. So I thought I'd take a minute to explain to our new listeners what this show is all about. Cashing Out is a weekly show that follows one cannabis entrepreneur's journey through the sale of their company. To start this off, we're selling my company, OG Ventures, which owns 50% of the Cannabis World Congress Business Expo. So every week we've had guests come on to ask me questions about the company, and we've really just discussed the whole process of selling a business. So in a few minutes, I'm going to get on the phone. We have two phone calls today, one with an investor and one with our lawyer. So... That's basically the the format of the show, and every week we you know we get a little bit deeper into it until hopefully we have a sale, a successful sale, and we try to share as much information with the listeners as possible, so that you know what it's like to sell a company in the cannabis business. All right, so let's get started. Let me get my first investor bull on the phone. Hello, C. Hutton. Hey, C. It's Dan Humiston. Hey, Dan. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. How are you? I'm doing well, sir. Good to hear from you. For your listeners, you will remember C.E. Hutton as the managing director of Legacy Partners 5280 Fund. Like um, C.E. was on our show it's a little bit ago. See, I think you were episode 20, but we chatted for a while. So, C., it's great to have you back on the show. Well, oh, Dan, it's always good to hear from you. We had a great show, and as I told you before, I was looking forward to getting back with you and doing another one, and here we are. <laughs> and I said, I know you'll be back on, so we are back together. <laughs> well, you may hear some background music, or background music, you may hear some background noise. I'm actually in, okay. I'm actually in Boulder today. I'm in Boulder. Oh, good old Boulder, yeah. Colorado, huh? Yeah. Excellent. I'm in Boulder. My my daughter, Logan, is a sophomore here, and she invited me to lunch today. So, Oh, nice. Yeah. Very nice. So I'm winging it in Boulder, doing my first Boulder interview with, with C.E. Hutton. So it's, everything's lining up great. So I'm just to, to, to tee this up for our listeners, because in case they haven't heard this, how we do this aspect of, of our show, Cashing Out, we're following one entrepreneur's journey, which happens to be me one entrepreneur's journey through the sale of their cannabis company. And when we have occasional investor bulls come on our show mm -hmm. to, to talk to us uh, or to talk to me, ask me questions or somewhat put me on the hot seat like you would if you had a deal that you think, you know what? I want to learn a little bit more about this company. Yes. Understood. And so I'm going to turn the mic over to you. And I'm going to follow your lead. However, you normally do it when you get into that what I'm going to call round round two of a deal. All righty. Well, Dan, thanks again. I had a had a chance to review the information that you had sent forward. OG Ventures LLC. Uh, I have to tell you, I love the name. Certainly <laughs> gets some get, gets an attention getter. It gets an attention, you know. But so OG Ventures. Uh, so I'm looking at this 50 percent ownership of Leading Edge Expositions, and then Leading Edge owns 100% of Cannabis World Congress and Business Expositions, CWCB Expos. So getting into that kind of business, trade show ownership and, and those kind of pieces, can you just enlighten me, Dan, how those pieces came together between OG, Leading Edge, and also yeah. obviously delivering service to uh, CWCB sure. Expos? Well, I'll give you the real, the real condensed, condensed version. Uh -huh. I had a lot of experience in the former industry running trade shows and went to a show in Seattle that MJ Biz put on and said, this is wide open. I need to do a trade show. And that was in 2013. Did a show in Las Vegas in 2014 and another one in New York in 2014. 
And out of the blue, I got approached by a big trade show company, M- H.A. Bruno, who has 40 years of experience in the trade show industry. Mm. And they wanted to get into the cannabis industry. They wanted to, st- they wanted to start a show. And long story short, we ended up selling 50% of the company to H.A. Bruno, uh, the managing partner over there, Ralph Iannuzzi. Uh, moved the whole operation from my offices in Buffalo to their offices in New Jersey. They have the infrastructure. They have the team. They were running a show called the Franchise Show, which they had, I don't know, shows all over the world where they did this uh-huh. franchise. And so just, you know, built right into their already existing infrastructure. And that's how it started. And, you know, that's how we ended up with 50% of it. They're the managing partners. As time went on, I, for the last five years, I've worked... This has been my full-time job, but as time went on, my, my roles got replaced as we brought in more and more key people. And okay. little by little, I'm, you know, I'm out of a job and I'm an entrepreneur. I'm not an investor. So I, I, I need to, you know, move on to the next venture, which is the MJ Bulls podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dan, that, that's a very interesting, you know, it, it certainly lends itself to uh, longevity, at least in my opinion, when something's able to be absorbed, if you will, into existing infrastructure, into a, if you will, a, a legacy of doing that kind of work. And you can certainly bolster a business with that. So that's that's good background to know and understand. Uh, I didn't know that much about that, that industry, but uh, certainly a solid business decision in that respect. One of the things also I wanted to ask you, Dan, is you know, we go to these kind of conferences and think, you know, we're, we're there and a lot of people, they're putting on shows, but the cost element of those things are, is very interesting to me. And one of the things I noted from you was that barriers to entry are high. And I was interested from your expertise and what you've seen with the company, just a couple of what those barriers are and how that statement is being made. Yeah. For the first thing, it's difficult to get key locations. Hotels are uh-huh. not to, hotels are not hard, but we're in convention centers and gotcha. especially for cannabis, it's tough to have the credibility to get it into a convention center or a key location. That's our first that's your first barrier. The second barrier is most of your costs are up front. So you need you need the upfront cash to get it off the ground. Exhibitors tend to be slow pay, so you're carrying uh-huh. you end up carrying a lot of your cost gotcha. almost up to the day of the show. Okay. So that's really the second barrier to entry and probably the biggest one is is having enough cash to fund you know to fund that float. Sure, absolutely. So you're certainly yeah, funding the float. You you know, Dan, it's it's one of the other things we know that the trade shows, uh, particularly B2B, you know, and I, I saw a comment around high growth and they trade high. What's the life cycle that you have seen with these B2B trade shows and that continual growth cycle with these high multiples? Two, five, ten years? What, what's your take on that? Well, I mean, my best experience was in my former industry that I was in, and that cycle really paralleled the industry that I was in. I was in the indoor tanning industry, and it very really paralleled that. Ah, indoor tanning. Yeah. Nice. Okay. <laughs> so our trade shows really paralleled how the industry was doing. But as consolidation occurred, there was a period of time where we, where we where our shows became very, very profitable. And then you could see, feel that it just started because, you know, one, what used to represent four companies now turned into one company and what used to represent maybe 10,000 yes. or, or 10, 10 booths now represented five booths. And so, yes. but that's a, I mean, we are eons away from that in this industry. I think what... <laughs> You know, what we're banking on is that mainstream businesses, once they feel confident to get enough to get into this industry, they need a soft landing place, someplace that yeah. they feel comfortable. I, I don't think the party scene in Las Vegas is exactly equipped for that group today. It will be someday, but it, today it's not. Oh, yeah. I think oh, yeah. being in New York City, being in Los Angeles, more of a business, more of a kind of a little bit hate to use this expression, but button up show than it would be a more relaxed party atmosphere is, is probably more conducive for that crowd that we're trying to get. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree with that comment. Well, certainly with those markets, big markets, big media markets, big high traffic, high attention markets, would you say that you've got a captive marketplace there in those two markets? Yeah. The best part about those shows is that we don't have to draw people in from other 
yes. from other areas. I mean, we can survive just in the driving, in our driving radius and thrive. I shouldn't say to survive. We can thrive with just in the driving radius. I mean, those are within a one hour or two hour driving radius. Is, you know, it's, sure. prob- it's probably Absolutely. a third of the population or at least a quarter yeah, of the saying, population. You couldn't be in better markets. I mean, really. Yeah. I mean, unbelievable. It's I know. And, and having the equity being, I mean, we've been, this is our sixth year in New York and our fifth year in Los Angeles. So we have the equity of year after year. People, you know, if they want to exhibit New York city, we're the show and, and Los Angeles, there are a few, there are a few shows in California, but you know, we're the show in the Los Angeles convention center. And so I think is, I just feel like we're really, the, the show is, is positioned great for the entrance of mainstream American businesses. I think we're particularly hemp as hemp starts to yeah. become, I just feel like we're really well positioned for that. And, you know, so, but we have a lot of work ahead of us. And, and again, I, I'm not the kind of person that likes to watch other people do, do their work. I like to be the person doing the work and, and I would, and I have a lot of ex- ideas, some with this podcast and some with others, but that I just really like to run with. And so it's time for me to move on. And that's yeah. you know, the reason that I'm put, that I put this deck together. And well, then I think you said, I spoke a little bit about it earlier was the whole thing about anytime anybody does anything, it is truly about what's your why. And I know that you said in the beginning, listen, I've kind of done my time on Maple Drive, so to speak. <laughs> MJ Bulls is your baby now. And I just, you know, was there anything else with that, Dan? Just focus on MJ Bulls or any kind of life things that you want to do? Well, I, I have three kids. And yeah. so, you know, like, it's nice to have a little time to spend with my kids. But really, I, I'm anxious to get this. I have a lot of ambitious ideas with the podcast that I want yes. to pursue. And that's, so that's really my, where my energies are going to be focused. For, for at least for the short term, but it, yeah, to stay tuned because there's a I can't tell you how many great ideas people like you have given me about the show and saying, Dan, just why don't you run with this idea? Oh, whoa, we could do that. <laughs> if, if I covered all the ideas, I would have to. I need I need at least three more people doing shows with well, me. So it's gonna be but fun. Dan, isn't it beautiful? Isn't it beautiful to have a clean slate to create whatever you want to create? That's a beautiful thing. That's you know what, CE. That's what I think about this industry. We, mm-hmm. all, we all have an opportunity to write our own story. This is That's an industry right. that we have. It's a clean slate. And That's if you right. want to be in the podcast business, it's all green lights. The whole way down the road, it's green lights. All you have to do is just start driving. And if you want to be in the, and if you want to be, <laughs> and you know, so, and you know this better than anyone. I mean, I want to make sure that I, that I was going to bring this up at the beginning, but we'll bring it up in the close is that, I mean, you have a unique niche that no one else has even taken a chance to do it. I don't, for those of you that didn't listen to CE's episode back at episode 20, he has a mandate in his, in the Legacy Partners 5280 Fund, which 5280, by the way, stands is for mile high. That's how many feet mile in Denver is. (laughs) But you have a mandate in that, in your fund, which a portion of, of the money that you raise will be invested in minority owned cannabis businesses. I think that needs to be shouted from the hills. And that's why Absolutely. Because it's there's so much opportunity out there and it's getting overlooked. And I think that Absolutely. And like I said, you have all green lights down your road too. <laughs> all you got to yeah. do is just oh, drive. Absolutely, Dan. You know, whether it's, you know, and particularly with us, and thanks for, uh, thanks for that, for that note. I mean, literally we, we see ourselves as, you know, with, with our minority focused segment of that being a purveyor of dreams. And we certainly want to make those things happen because it's a niche and a marketplace that needs to be spoken to and spoken about. So we're, uh, we're very, very proud of that. So thank you for mentioning that again, Dan. Appreciate oh. that. But, like you said, it's creating from a slate and uh, beautiful gardens and beautiful things happen when you have a chance to create. It, it, so we, we're there. Well, we're all having fun, I think. That's that's the best part about this is we're in industry. It's fun. We're with people that are fun. And yes. it's, it's fun to succeed. <laughs> and we Absolutely. So that's Absolutely. Good. Well, I'm going to let well, you Dan, I, I congratulate you on your success with the business and certainly more congratulations and best wishes to you on the new life. And uh, this has really been interesting and uh, insightful for me. And I really appreciate you allowing me to be a guest today and go through this with you. Yeah. And I appreciate you doing it. And if there's any more information that that you need, or you want to look at additional information, just let me know and we will move on from there. 
But, Absolutely, Dan. So thank you so much. You're welcome. And I will uh, hopefully we'll have you on again very soon. I certainly hope so, Dan. Have a great afternoon. I appreciate it. Okay. Before we jump on our next call, let me just do a little bit of business and thank one of our sponsors, Blaze, which is a cannabis technology company. They make software for dispensaries and distributors. And soon they'll be launching a new software for cultivation and manufacturing. Chris Violas is the CEO over there. He was on the MJ Bulls podcast a few episodes ago. Good guy. So if you're a dispensary or distributor and you're looking for software, check out Blaze. It's blaze.me, blaze.me. Okay, now let's get to our next guest. Hey, Dan, what's going on? Well, today, Larry, it's just you and me. Dina is not with us today, but one of the things that we are hearing from some of the people that are interested in buying is that they want me to not get involved in trade shows or conferences. And, you know, there's some, there's some things I'd like to do with the MJ Bulls podcast that could resemble a conference. Um, it'd be more of a, a, more of an event type of things, but, and I'm just not sure where I should go with this. I don't know. So I wanted to hear from you, explain what the intent of a non-compete is, how we can carve it out in a way that I can still do stuff with the podcast and not be in violation of it. Okay. Well, it's a very interesting topic, Dan, and the truth of the matter is it's one of the most important issues that anyone who is selling their business will face, uh, but people tend to look past it. And that's for a very specific reason. Uh, we, we typically think of non-competes within the context of an employee who's been working for you and is now going to leave and they want to go work for a competitor. Uh, and you don't want that to happen. You've spent a lot of time teaching them, training them, introducing them to your customers. And the last thing you do is you want them to go across town and sit down and start using all that knowledge and information to help someone else. What we've seen in the standard world is that non-competes are often not enforceable. But to really understand that, and I'll try not to get too technical here, uh, what we're really talking about is something called a restrictive covenant. People use the term non-compete interchangeably with a lot of other things, and that's where the confusion comes in. But we have a restrictive covenant. So there's three types. The first is the traditional non-compete that says, I won't go work for a competitor. The second one is a non-solicitation. I will not solicit your customers or your employees. And the third one is a confidentiality agreement. I will not disclose any confidential information I learn while working here. People tend to call all three of them non-compete, but they're really not. And this is why it's important. In the standard employee context, the non-compete itself is typically not enforceable. Of course, not going to restrict someone from earning a living unless the employer can really show they were the, the top boss and had, you know, knew all the secret formulas and we can't let them go. Um, non-solicitations and confidentiality agreements will typically be enforced if certain standards are met. But it's that non-compete that really gets everybody thinking. And people say, oh, you know, I've heard of employees who leave and the non-compete and, the, you know, they, they go ahead and they do it anyway. But it's a little bit different when we're talking about the sale of a business. When people sell a business, the buyer will almost always ask for a non-compete. And the reason is because the buyer has just got done purchasing all of your goodwill that you have built up over the years. That's why they're buying your business and not just starting a new one necessarily. Your business has a reputation. It has a name. People know about it. When they hear about it, they're like, oh, right, that conference, that's the one we want to go to. So that, that's really what you're paying for. If the seller can sell you all of that and then two weeks later come back and say, hey, I'm starting my own brand new conference business. And people say, well, wait, we, you know, we've always wanted to work with Dan. Uh, we don't know who this new guy is. And even though he bought the business, if Dan is coming back, we're going to stay with Dan. So the guy who bought the business says, hey, wait a second. I just paid you money for all this goodwill, and you immediately took it right back by opening up across the street from me. So when we have a, a non-compete that's given ancillary to the sale of a business as part of the sale of a business, courts will enforce those all day long. So if you are selling your business, you need to understand that that means for some period of time after the sale, you will not be allowed to go back into that same business. 
unless the seller or excuse me, the buyer says, yeah, go ahead. We don't care, which they usually don't. So I deal with people who are getting ready to sign the documents and I always say to them, what are you going to do next? Well, I might, you know, take a few months off and then I think I'm going to go start up a new business. And I said to them, you can start a new business, but not in this area, not in this market, not that it's going to compete with them. It has to be something completely different. Well, it's a pretty big umbrella trade show conferences. That's a really big umbrella that could it argue, is. it could arguably be a lot of things that, you know, are kind of in the gray area. So when yep. we, when we do this, we got to make sure that we carve out some of those or, or define some of those gray areas. Is that, is that typical? 100%. Okay. And it's very, in fact, you've hit the nail right on the head. What I will tell my clients when they are selling is tell me what you want to do next. And let's see if we can figure out a way to carve out an exception to the non-compete to allow this type of activity. And, you know, some some purchasers will be flexible enough and say, yeah, sure, you can go ahead and do that. And, and sometimes they will even say to the people, you know, I don't mind if you stay in the industry or associated with the industry because, you know, you bring a very positive influence on the industry. And every time somebody hears your name, they're going to think of your business, which I now own. So I don't care if they come in and do the business because they think you own it. Hey, that's fine with me. As long as they're coming in and giving me business, that's the important thing. But you're absolutely right. You need to know and you need to go in and part of the negotiations. You want to carve out that little space that'll let you go do what you want to do next. Okay. Well, this has been, we've been speaking with Larry Michigan, who is from the Michigan Law Group. And he's also of counsel with the Hoban Law Group. And they can handle any of your cannabis related or non cannabis related issues. So, Larry, thanks again for being the reoccurring legal expert on our show, and I probably will talk to you next week uh, if, you're, if you're around. Uh, I am around, Dan. I will look forward to it. And once again, I thank you for the opportunity. It's a lot of fun, and I really enjoy it. Yeah, me too. Thanks. Okay, that's our show for today. I want to thank Jamie Humiston for composing the music for this show. All the original music was, was by Jamie Humiston. Also, if anybody has any questions, comments, criticisms, ideas, please email me at connect at mjbulls.com. Have a great week, and I'll see you next week. <laughs>